Hey, listen, Pastor Jason's going to be here next week. Uh, we are uh, kicking off actually part two of a series we did called Essentials, uh, studying through the book of Romans. But this week, we have a very special guest. He is not only a friend of Pastor Jason and myself and so many of our staff members, he is a friend of Bethlehem Church. Many of you have had the opportunity to hear him before, and you have been blessed. If you have not, you are about to be blessed. He's also got some really exciting news to, uh, to tell you uh, that's really, really cool. Uh, but Dave Edwards is with us today. And would you do me a favor, put your hands together and welcome, welcome our friend, Dave Edwards. All right. Welcome, church. It's so good to get to be here. My name's Dave. Everyone say hi, Dave. And I'm a longtime friend. I have a lot of good memories with Matt and Jason. We've done a lot of ministry on the road and all around Georgia and leadership camps. And so the real, the, our real friends are the friends that remain throughout the seasons. And so Jason has been with me and I've been with him through all the seasons. I'm so glad to get to be back. I'm so excited about what God is doing at Bethlehem. How many of y'all are excited about what's coming up in the next chapter of the history of your church? Such a powerful thing. So exciting. And this, you may not know it, but today at Bethlehem is a historic moment. You may not have felt it driving in, but I'm about to tell you why this is ground shifting, paradigm shifting. Since I was here a year ago, I got married. That's right, kids. There really is a God. And uh, I had no idea. And Caroline, my wife, is right over here. Get, Caroline, give her a little wave out. There she is right there. So when you see her... This is our first trip, married trip together to Georgia, and this is my first married sermon in Georgia. How about that? Historic. Like, I, you know, I, I thought I'd be a bastard to the rapture, quite honestly. I thought I would, this is not ever going to happen. And so for me to get married is like book of Acts, like signs and wonders and miracles. Like, it's an amazing thing. And so this is my first time to ever be married. And I know some of you are thinking, your first time? You're kidding. No. I'm not saying I got married late in life. I'm just saying that I took the vows and got my AARP card in the same week. That's all I'm saying. I think that says it all. And so, but here's what I want to do tonight. I want to talk to us about what I call the invisible giant of the Christian life. It's invisible because most of us never see it. And it's a giant because most of us, we feel its presence. We just don't know what it is. This invisible giant has the ability to fly under the radar screen of our life and to take whatever you've achieved, whatever is good, and to rip the joy out from underneath it. It's the reason why some people are never happy. It's, the, it's because of this giant. It's the reason why no matter what kind of raise, what kind of position, what kind of promotion, what happens in your kid's life, what happens in your home, you, we have that sense that it's just not good enough that it could have been better, that it could have gone a different way. It's the result of the presence of this giant. It's this giant, the invisible giant of the Christian life that has driven a lot of people into counseling and driven a lot of people and created a lot of angst towards the church and a lot of anxiety about God. It's, it's not God. It's not his word. The invisible giant of the Christian life is the thing that will go after whatever God is doing in your life that is good and to take all the joy out of it. It is the invisible giant of the Christian life. You want to know what it is? You want to know what it is? Okay, I'm not going to tell you. And uh, no, it is the invisible giant of comparison. Comparison. Now, let me give you a work, my working definition for comparison so we kind of get all on the same page tonight. Comparison is any time we measure ourselves against an external standard or another person to determine whether we're happy or not. Anytime that you measure your life, your marriage, your stuff against somebody else's life, marriage stuff, to determine whether you should be happy about your life, that is the invisible giant of comparison. And for many of us, we have taken a royal beat down by comparison, and you never saw it come into your life, and you never see it move. You don't really know what it's called. You think, well, it just must be me. And it is the, the action and the activity of the invisible giant of comparison. Now, you can well imagine me getting married is a, it's a major shift, but like I didn't know anything about weddings, you know, I, I, I've learned, since learned, that weddings are all about comparison. 
That's what it is. Let's take a little, little show of hands. To the ladies in the house, do we have any ladies that has been a bridesmaid in a wedding? Anybody? Just by show of hands. Anybody been a bridesmaid in more than one wedding? Anybody? Okay, how many? Someone yell at Five or more? Anybody five or more? I'm like the wedding auctioneer now, right? And five, anybody been in 10? Bridesmaid, 10, five, five to 10 weddings? All right, so all these ladies have heard the same lie, right? They've all heard, you can wear the dress again. If, <laughs> if you're going to an eighth grade prom, yes, you can. That'll work, you'll, you'll fit right in. And you know, they, uh, uh, now who, who's been, in, anybody been in five weddings or more, anybody? How many have you been in? Right there in the, how many, three? Like six? Uh, are you bitter about that? Are you okay with it? Like you're all right with it? You're not bitter about it? Like, I, I, you know, I had a friend of mine that's been a, a bridesmaid in 10 weddings and can turn any conversation in to the fact that she's been in 10 weddings. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. You're like, can you believe the spring weather? Can you believe the pollen? Yeah, there's a lot of pollen. I've been in 10 weddings. <laughs> angry about the fact that she's been in 10 weddings. You're like, hey, did you see the game? I saw the game. I've been in 10 weddings, always a bridesmaid, never a bride. And to me, that's like saying, always a pallbearer, never a corpse. You know what I'm saying? And uh, <laughs> Too bitter, sorry. And, um, <laughs> but weddings are all about comparison. What does the bride do? The bride picks four or five of her favorite friends and then puts them in the ugliest outfit she can find. <laughs> that's so when the groom looks them all over at the back of the room, he's like, well, I got the best one, right? It's all about comparison. On the groom side, they're all dressed exactly alike. That's so if the groom backs out, everyone just takes a step over because it's a man, there is no comparison. You see what I'm saying, right? Weddings are all about comparison. And in our life, we've taken beat downs in different areas by the invisible giant of comparison. So what do we do about this? I sense that my assignment tonight was to help us to be able to spot that invisible giant, to know why it's there, and then to know what to do about it. And so how do we deal with this? This is one of the things that makes the Word of God so powerful. You ever heard someone quote that verse that the Word of God is living and active? Is that here we are reading something that's thousands of years old that is dealing with something that we're going through at this very moment today. And so this is what brings me to my text because there is a story in the Old Testament about comparison. And so here's what happens. God, Israel or God's chosen people, he liberates them from captivity he takes them up to the edge of the promised land. I'm just going to give you a little backstory of what's happening in this text. And they pick out 12 spies, one from each of the tribe of Israel. They send them into the promised land. And God says, go into the promised land and look at what I'm about to give you. It's called the promised land, kids, because God promised it. All right, I'm a Bible scholar. And so they send these 12 spies into the land. And it's, sure enough, it is the land of milk and honey. The spies cannot believe what they see. The produce that this land yields was so massive that it took two guys to carry back a bushel of grapes. And so they haul this produce back to, to the camp and they go, it's everything that God said it was. Now remember, this is where God's going to send Israel into the promised land. Now this is where we pick it up. Now I'm going to show you how comparison gets into this. This is a beautiful moment. This is a moment of seeing the promise and tasting of it knowing that God was for him. Now look, look how this escalates. Now if you got your Bible, Numbers chapter 13, we pick up this story. The spies go into the land, they come back to the camp, they bring the produce with them. And here's where we pick it up. Let me just read part of it so you can hear it. So they come back and they say, verse 27, chapter 13, ready? And thus they told him and said, we went into the land where you sent us. And it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. They're like, look at this produce. Now look at, listen to verse 28. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and their cities are fortified and very large. Verse 31, and we were not able to go up against these people, for they were too strong for us. You see it? They're starting to compare themselves. Now listen to verse 33. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in theirs. And comparison steps in to the camp of Israel and fear breaks out among the nation because of the work of the invisible giant of comparison. What then? Regardless of our age or stage, regardless of what brought us in here today, what then do we do? How, how do we know 
how to see this invisible giant of comparison. How do we spot it? How do we deal with it? Well, here we go. Now, I'm a point guy. Some of y'all know this, but we just say it anyway. I'm a little bit short attention span. Where are my short attention span people? Just by show of hands, people that cannot pay attention for more than a few seconds. Of course, YouTube has ruined our attention span, right? Because any of you guys ever watch a video and like you're three seconds into it and you start punching the screen, want to know how much time is left. Some of y'all are wanting to do that to my face. How much time is left in the sermon? You know, move it along. Right, so I'm a short attention span. So I'm not sure if I'm officially ADD. I'm ADD HD, which means I can't pay attention, but I do it in high definition. So I have great clarity <laughs> about what I'm distracted about. All right, so I, I, I wanna put our, the, the comments about this dealing with comparison into three points tonight. So what, how do we do this? If you got your note page, your listening page today, I'm gonna ask you to fill in the blanks as we go through it. You ready? So. Watch this, here we go. So number one is that we have to be alert to the symptoms. Anytime comparison is at work in our life, there are always two major symptoms. Ready? A, if you're taking notes, we distort other people's success. Look what it says, look what they say. And we, nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong and their cities are fortified and very large. Well, it's true that the promised land was occupied by giants. That's true, but Israel was God's people and the giants weren't bigger than God who was their strength. And yet comparison gets into their minds and their hearts and they begin to distort what they see. They're so giant. They live in fortified cities. They have everything. This is why when people compare, nobody ever compares down, right? We never compare down. No one ever says, you know, I have way too much money. Why can I have more poverty in my life? No one ever says that. No one ever says, you know, I am way too good looking. Why can I be uglier? You know, surveys show that people spend more time staring at good looking people than they do average people, which explains why every time I speak, people look at me. And uh, <laughs> now I know, right? No one ever says, you know, I have way too many friends. Why can I be hated by more people, right? We always compare up. Right? Someone else has more money. Someone else has a better life. Someone else has better friends. Someone else had an easier life, got better breaks. Things went better for them. Than the, we have a tendency to look at someone else's life. And what comparison does is that it feeds our minds with all these scenarios of what happiness is and what our life should be and where we should be by now. And then we take these scenarios and we project it on somebody that we don't really even know. And the truth is, None of us know what someone else's life is like. It's all assumptions. We just assume it's easier, better. There's, they, they have more stuff than we do. We just assume all of it. And the invisible giant of comparison says, at your age, you should be at a different place by now. Look at these people. They're your age. And anytime we compare, we always distort other people's success. And the second symptom is that we always discount ourselves. This is what they do. Look, you see both of these things happening in verse 33. Look at this. Look at verse 33. Nevertheless, look at this. We became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So they said, they're so big, we're so small. They have everything. We don't have anything. We just got, we just got out of Egypt. We're refuge. We don't have anything. And all they're, all they're doing is saying, these people have everything going for them and they're, they're giant and their cities are fortified and we don't have anything. We're like grasshoppers. We're small and insignificant because anytime comparison goes to work in any of our lives, we always discount ourselves. We distort other people's success and we find a way to put ourselves down. This is why no matter what happens in some people's lives, they're never happy. It's because the invisible giant of comparison says it could have been better. It could have gone a different way. And now, you know, this is different for all of us. I mean, it hits, comparison attacks people in different ways, right? For some people, it attacks them physically. And there's a reason why in our culture, the libraries are empty and the gyms are full, right? Because some people, they have a whole body image thing and no matter how much weight they lose, they always find, manage to find someone who's thinner, someone who has less body fat or has more muscle gain. And it happens in terms of how we feel about ourselves physically. The you know, surveys show that a woman spends 50% of her life worrying about how her hair looks. 
And surveys also show that a man spends 50% of his life not noticing. And, uh, and so, you know, this physical thing, men and women handle this in a completely different way. Well, women freak out about, like, women always have something they want to change about that. I want to change my hair. I want to change my nails. I wish I was thinner. I wish I was taller. Uh, a woman can always find something they want to change in some way. Men don't think like that, right? For a man, the fatter a man gets, the more he brags. Right, a woman's like, oh, I, I don't like the way I look. A man will be like, look at that right there. What's that, about eight months right there? That's a lot of Krispy Kremes right there. We just use mirrors in a different way. A, women see their flaws in a mirror, right? Man, a man, when he looks in the mirror, every man thinks he's one setup away from going out with a supermodel, right? That's just how it is. It's different. We handle comparison in different ways. It hits people physically. It hits people financially. Some of us, it hits us when we go to work because we see someone who's our age that's three positions ahead of us. You think, man, that guy didn't know any more than I know. And she doesn't know any more than I know. How did she get the promotion and I didn't? How, they're, how are they making that much money and I'm not? I should be at that place by now. And for some people, it's the finances where comparison hits. Either we're in debt and where you feel like you're so way down and everyone looks to you like they're out of debt and they're flying through life. People get promoted and they're making more money than you think. Man, I went to high school with this guy. This guy cheated off my papers. How did he get ahead? Right, it hits people physically. It hits people financially. It hits people professionally in terms of where they are in a company or where they think they should be in terms of their own job and their own work and their own skill set. And we see someone we know, a lot of times comparison hits because we see somebody we know that's ahead of us. Most of us, we don't compare ourselves to strangers. We don't even know, we don't know most, a lot of people. But when you see someone you know that has something that you think you should have and you don't, comparison man steps right into that gap and creates all kinds of angst. It happens to people relationally, right? I mean, I spent most of my life being single, right? I, everywhere I went, you know, like, I, I, you know, all my married, all my friends are married, and they're all like, when are you gonna get married? When are you gonna get married? I'm like, hey, I'm not following you around going, when are you gonna be alone? When are you gonna be by yourself, right? <laughs> all my married friends are so pushy. I'm like, do you win something if I get married? Do you get a garden weasel or a free pack of sea monkeys or something? It seemed like a competition. Every time I, every time I officiated a wedding, and it got out that the, that the, the pastor was single, all the old people at the wedding would all, after it was over, would all come to me and go, you're next, <laughs> you're next. It happened wedding after wedding. I hated it, you're next. I finally figured a way to put that to an end. Now every time when I go to a funeral, <laughs> you're next, that's so cute, you're next. <laughs> we just crossed out of, preaching into therapy, and now we're back to the sermon. All right, so, right? So it happens between people that are single and people that think, all, all my friends are married. When am I going to be married? I'm at a certain age. I need to be married. When you get married, what's the big question? When are you going to have kids? When are you going to have kids? Right, people always say, when are you going to have kids? When are we going to hear the pitter-patter little feet? I'm like, whenever you buy a dog. And, all right, right? And then when you have kids, what do they do? When are you going to have another one? Having one, that's just a hobby kid. You gotta have two, right? Well, you have two. Why don't you have a third one? If you can raise two, you can raise three. And then you get them grown up. You're like, we're empty nesters. When are you gonna have grandkids, right? I mean, it never ends. And comparison keeps pushing its way into the blessed areas of our life. You see it? It hits us financially and physically and relationally, and it hits people spiritually. You better believe comparison is at work in the world of faith. This is, I've, I've been speaking for two and a half decades. And I've seen it everywhere I go. Yeah, uh, you know, I started 12 citywide Bible studies for single adults in 12 different cities. I'd fly to them to speak. All those rooms, there was always comparison. And you had it on both sides of the aisle. You'd have somebody that was a brand new believer and they would walk into a room like this, and the band would be incredible, the atmosphere is incredible, and someone who's on their way to Christ or someone who's a new believer looks around and goes, these people are so spiritual. 
man, these people, they can sing without looking at the screen. They can pray on cue. They have verses out of the Bible memorized. They look across the room and see people with their hands up. And a new believer says, well, these people have questions. Why doesn't someone call on them? Right? I mean, and they look around and think, man, these people have, they got, man, they walk with God. I don't know if I could ever be that spiritual. These people are so far ahead of me. And likewise, on the other side of the aisle, you got someone like me that's grown up in church. Like I, I feel like I was born in a Baptist church. I grew up going to church my whole life. You got someone who's grown up inside the church world and they look at someone as a new believer and they go, man, God got a hold of that guy. I mean, that guy's got a testimony. That God pulled that guy out of darkness into light. Me, I just kind of grew up in the church. Well, what is that? That's the enemy of comparison. Because comparison wants us to believe that somehow if we all don't have the same experience with Jesus, that our experience isn't valid. And so you've got insiders and outsiders comparing themselves to each other. And one of the amazing things about the presence of the Lord is that what God is doing in people over here is different than what he's doing in people over here. We all don't know the same things about God this evening. We all haven't experienced every dimension of this saving power. Some of us were rescued out of things miraculously. Some of us were spared from things because we grew up in the church. We all know different dimensions of God. We're at different places and different stages. But if comparison has its way, it'll find a way to undervalue your journey with the Lord and make you think, well, it's not that. It, you know, I, I just kind of always have been around it. I have to say this is, I'm a little ramped up about this because this is personal to me. You know, I have to say I, I almost missed the call of God in my life because of comparison. I mean, what I'm doing tonight was, I had a dream of doing this when I was 16. I wanted to travel and teach the Bible in a creative way. I talked about it on the podcast, so I'll talk about it this week on the podcast. And I wanted to teach the Bible in a creative way. But I almost said no, you know why? Because every speaker that ever came to my church always had the craziest stories you ever heard in your life. They would go, I, you know, I, was, I grew up in the trunk of a Buick. I bled through my eyes and I couldn't see and now I'm living for Jesus. And I'm like, you know, I'm listening to all this. People would get up and go, I was an ax murderer and I went to prison and I found Jesus and now I've written a book called Ax Me About God. And you know, I'm like, I don't even, that's that legal? Can you even say that? Is that even, that's, that's you know. And I, I, I'm out there listening to this, you know? I'm listening to these crazy stories. I'm thinking, God can't use me. I mean, what's my story going to be? I, I once smoked a Crayola, right? I mean, well, you know, what's my story going to be? I once read a book in bad light. I was born to be mild. I mean, you know, I, and I almost said no because I was comparing myself to everybody else's testimony. Your story is yours. And what God is doing in you is unique to you. And you need to be okay with that. See, I I think what's happened in our life is we bought into this culture, the culture of our culture that everything is a race, right? I gotta be out front, I gotta be first, and second is the first loser, and and I gotta gotta have more. And so we end up in this race of trying to keep up with everybody. Right, I, I, you know it's true if you're a parent, right? And you, you're like, you're like, you know, you see someone, another mom with one of those cool strollers with the three knobby tires and the handbrake. You're like, look at that stroller! Oh, I just had this navy blue plastic folding one that I got at Costco. I, I hate my life, right? Or if I mean, you you get a town and country that has eleven cup holders and someone else gets an Odyssey that has fifteen, you're like, I can't, right? And we spend our whole life trying to keep up with the Joneses, only to discover the Joneses have refinanced and you lose again, right? I mean, that, you see what's happening? Uh, did you ever think there'd be a day where you would feel shame for owning a Yeti and not a Stanley? Did you ever think that would happen? Did you ever think you'd put their, your hand over the Yeti label so you would so you don't have a Stanley? What's wrong with you? You were so out of date. Right? And it's this endless grass you know, to get it and to have it. And somewhere along the way, we lost sight of the fact that life is not for competing, but for completing the will of God. Because in the end, the question for all of us is not, hey, did you keep up with your older brother or sister? Did you stay in pace with 
the houses that your friends had and the minivans that your friends had, the question we have to answer at the end of our life was, did you do what God designed you to do? Did you do the will he had for you? Or did you spend your life always being distracted by what you didn't have and what it could have been and what it should have been and why didn't I get invited to that party and why didn't no one ask me? You see what I'm saying? In the end, the question we have to answer is, did I find Christ and did I fulfill his will for my life? That's, that's the end question. Not did I keep up with everybody. Not did I outdo my brothers and sisters. But did I keep up with it? Did I do what God called me to do and what he designed me to do? This is the question that we all have to deal with at the end of our life. You see it? So when comparison gets into our life, we have to be alert to the symptoms. Not only that, but big point number two, if you're taking notes today on your listening guide, we have to be aware of the strategy. We have to be aware of the strategy, right? This is not, this is not accidental, right? This wasn't, just, the, the giant of comparison didn't just roam into the camp of Israel and thought, hey, I, I think I'll just wreak some havoc here. There is a strategy. It's not coincidental that you feel these things and that you think these things and you feel like you're left out or left behind or not good enough or whatever it may be. And we see the strategy right here in chapter 14 of verse 3. Now look at this. Look at this. Chapter 14, verse 3. Now watch this. Look at this. The first strategy of comparison is A, to get us to distrust God. To get us to distrust God. Comparison is trying to get you and I to pull back from the Lord. Look what happens. Look at this. Look what they say. Verse 3, chapter 14. Why is the Lord bringing us into the land to fall by the sword? I mean, think about what they're saying. Why is God bringing us into this place to have us be murdered by these people? Think about what Israel went through to get here. They were delivered for 450 years of slavery. Every Pharaoh more tyrannical than the one that came before. God issued a series of plagues against the house of Pharaoh. He gets them out of Egypt. He parts the Red Sea. They walk across a million plus Israelites, walk across on dry ground. They get to the other side only to see God cave the Red Sea back on the top of Pharaoh and his army. And they walk up to the edge of the promised land and God goes, Ta-da! And Israel's response is, God's trying to kill us. I'm sure God's like, no, you're way off. That's not even close. That's not at all what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get you into the next place that I have for you. But this is what comparison does to get us to distrust God. Most of us here tonight know enough not to deny Jesus. We know that he's the son of God. We know that he died on the cross. We know that he rose again. And whether you heard it here or you picked it up in the culture or you've seen the Christmas movies or the Easter play or whatever, we know enough to know that Jesus is really who he says he is, that he has saving power. And the invisible John of comparison knows that. So you know what comparison does? It tries to create just enough distrust that will get close enough to God to sing some songs, but not quite close enough to let him touch us. Close enough to hear some sermons. Close enough to have some fellowship with people, but not quite close enough to fully abandon ourselves. And so as a result, people come right up to that boundary line and they go, I don't know if I can trust God past this point. He might let me down. This might not work. What if I fail? What if I'm not good enough? And they make this sharp turn and they end up living a life parallel to what God has for them. You see it? The first strategy is to get us to distrust God, to pull up short. I wonder if we got anybody that you've gotten close. But tonight is about saying, I, I need to go all the way with him. I need to be all in. I, I need to give my full heart and my full soul. I, I can't just be sort of close and sort of in. Because the comparison has its way. It'll battle you back off that boundary line. It'll battle you back off of what God has for you by getting you to distrust God and thinking that it's not going to work if you go past this point. And then the second strategy is to be disappointed with our opportunities in life. Now look what they do. This is chapter 14, verse 3. Right? This is all in this one verse. Look at this. Watch this. Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Look at this. Would it not be better for us to turn to Egypt? Seriously, right? They're looking at the promised land and they all go, we'd rather go back there. 
We'd, I mean, at least in Egypt, we had an address. At least we had three meals a day and we knew where we lived. Sure, it was hard. Sure, it was tough. But what is up? We don't even know what is next. And comparison will always try to, to get us to believe that we could be happier someplace else. So you know what happens to a lot of people? It's to become hypnotized by the past. They romanticize it. Oh, man, if I could go back 10 years ago, my life was so good. I, I, if we could just, I mean, I love my kids, but when we didn't have kids and we didn't have any place to be and we could sleep in, I, I want to go back to. And so we end up romanticizing the past and becoming preoccupied by what we, I want to, high schoolers, high school, college students are like, I'd really, I want to go back to high school. I was at home, I had a pattern, I had my friends, it was predictable, it was safe. I don't like this college, I want to go back, I was happier back then. So we either get preoccupied by the past or we get hypnotized by the future. And we think one day, one day, that promotion is gonna come through and we're gonna upgrade. We're gonna move from this house to the next house and that house is gonna have a pool. And one day, well, the, the kids are gonna be where they need to be and it's, it's gonna be better. And so we end up being hypnotized by what's gonna be or we're preoccupied with what's been. Like, it, was, it was good back there and it's gonna be good way up there. But you know what Israel missed? That the blessing of God wasn't in the past and the blessing of God wasn't in the future. It was in this moment where God's at work in our life is in this moment. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, in this moment. Think of where Israel is in this text. They're on the boundary line. Behind them is Egypt. In front of them is the promised land. And God says, I want you to go in and look at it. I'm gonna give it to you. I want you to go walk around in it. But to do it, you're gonna have to step across that boundary line and trust me. And the invisible giant of comparison is right there to go, you guys are grasshoppers. Y'all are so small and look how big. And you, you can't, these cities, you'll never be able to overtake these cities. You're so weak. And they start to think, oh, we'd be happier someplace else. And I wonder if any of us has ever fallen into that where you thought one day or back some other day. And we miss that where God's at work is in the present. Now, Everybody deals with this. I get it. Like some of y'all have skin of Teflon. It's not a big deal to you. And you're like, whatever. I don't care what other people do. Some of us compare down. Some of us compare up, right? So we all, we all are hit differently in this. And everyone at some level, we, deal, we felt the sting of comparison. Now let me ask you a history question. How many of y'all knew that when Jesus was growing up, he had stepbrothers? Anyone ever know that? That Mary had kids after he was born? Anyone know that? Okay, well, that, it's true. It's a historical fact. Now you can't tell me. That household wasn't rampant with comparison. <laughs> Could you be the brother of Jesus without being compared? Can you imagine your mom, Mary, right? You're doing pile drivers off the sofa with your other brother and Mary comes in out of the kitchen and says, why can't you two settle down? Why can't you be more like your brother? Because he's God? <laughs> Good point, go back to playing. Yeah, right? I mean, everyone deals with it at some level. So what do we do about this? Well, this is point number three. We have to apply the safeguards. We have to be able to set something in place that will help us to do battle against this giant of comparison so we don't take a beat down from it every day or every week or whatever. But what do we do? Well, believe it or not, one of the things, that, once again, is so cool about the Word of God is that Psalm 37 is a psalm about comparison. Look at this. So out of this psalm, there comes three safeguards, right? So if you're taking notes, they'll be on the screen behind me. So here's safeguard number one is that we have to defer the role of God to God. In our life, there has to be a moment where we say, I want God to be God in my life. I get it, I can't be God, I can't run my own life, I can't rule over my own life. I've tried to and I haven't done a great job, so I'm gonna defer the role of God to God. I'm gonna let God lead and I'm gonna follow. Look, this is what he's talking about, look at this, watch this. Look at verse one. Do not fret because of evildoers. Don't be envious. This is about comparison, right? Don't fret because of what you see. Don't compare yourself to other people and wrongdoers. For they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herd. Now look at verse three. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. That word trust means to lean the full weight of your life onto something. 
Putting the weight of your body on that chair is an act of trust. The, the word trust means I'm going to take everything that's in my life and I'm going to lean it onto something. Look at the next phrase. Trust in the Lord. That word Lord means God's ability to control the situations, the circumstances, and the people of your life. So what's David working out on paper for us to see? That when I'm tempted to compare, I'm going to take the full weight of my life and I'm going to lean it on God's ability to get me where I need to be. God knows how to work it out. The house, the family, the kids, the job, the finances. I'm going to lean on God to get and his ability to get me where I need to be. Not only that, but say, for our number B is that we have to delight ourselves in the Lord. Look what he says. Look, look at this. Verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord. You see it? Your whole self, how you're designed, how you're made. My mom is and holds the record for the most wins in girls field hockey. She's been in Sports Illustrated twice. She has a field hockey field named after her called Edwards Field. And I struck out in kickball, right? So, I mean, what, you know, what am I going to do? I spend the rest of my life beating myself up like I was an art major. I was the daughter my mom never had. You know, that's all there was to it, you know? Well, at some point, I had to realize what my gifts were. I can't have somebody else's gifts. I can't live somebody else's life. At some point, I have to say, God, thank you for the way you wired me. Thank you for the way you put me together. This is, look at this. Delight your whole self, all that you are. Your strengths, your weaknesses, your hopes, your dreams, your failures, your success. Look at this. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. I'm going to delight in what God's doing, and I'm going to walk in his way. And then finally, look at this. He says, deny your right to compare. Look at verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers. Look at verse 8. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. If we compare ourselves long enough to somebody else's life, we'll compromise to get it. So he says, don't fret. Don't envy what you see. Because if you envy it long enough, you'll make decisions that will be outside the will of God in order to get it. You have the right to compare yourself to anybody you want to. You can pick anybody in this room, anybody in your neighborhood. But you also have the ability not to do it. You don't have to do it. Now, let me tell you how, why this is such a powerful thing. Because when you realize you don't have to compare, that's your first step towards freedom. You're like, wait a minute, I don't have to live in the shadow of somebody else. That's not my deal. The invisible giant of comparison is a bully spirit. And you have to stand up to it. So Israel had to stand up to the giants and they had to take possession of the promised land. They had to, moving into the promised land for you and I is symbolic of moving into the will of God. So God has something new for this church. There's a new land that you're gonna step into literally and figuratively. I felt like this was my assignment is to say, don't let the past or the lure of, the, of anything else around you keep you from where God is taking you as a church but to defeat it in your own life. I'm going to show you how to pray, all right? At the bottom of your page, there's four blanks. I'm going to ask you to write this prayer down. This is how you pray against the giant of comparison. You ready? The first blank, dear. Second blank, Jesus. Third blank, the word no. Fourth blank, more. Dear Jesus, no more. No more. I'm not given one more day one more week, one more month away to comparing myself to anybody or anything. I'm not measuring my life against somebody else's standard or idea. No more. And when you start to pray and you say, Jesus, because of who you are, and because of who you've made me to be, I say no more, no more. And maybe it's time for some of us that have been on the boundary line and comparison is keep, keeps trying to push you back from the life that God has for you. And maybe this is your moment. Today is your day to say no more to comparison and yes to God.